What, what just happened there? Uh-oh. Why did it stop? Nobody was talking about it. Today, I've got two special guests, all from various parts of the world, and hopefully they are still there. Albatross, are you still there? Yes. And there. so, Albatross in Russia, and Moonman, are you still there? Yes, I am. Uh, Moonman from Arizona. So, getting started a little bit here. So, starting with Albatross, since this is the first time you are on this show, maybe describe yourself a little bit of who are you, where have you come from, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Oh, well... Here we go. So, yeah, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm from Russia. Uh, well, at, at least I'm now very, now very in Russia. Uh, so, I'm learning English, so I may talk a little bit slow. As, as my uh, Fiddler's profile says, you may know me for several projects, like Zostrizy or Husky. So, yeah, that's me. Okay, so this is probably a good point to step back a little bit. And I'm sure, despite my efforts of dragging the Fediverse into as many threads as I can on centralized social media such as Facebook and Twitter, I think we should probably all between the three of us start a little bit by describing exactly what is the Fediverse. So we'll start with Albatross. We'll start with you on that one. How would you describe the Fediverse to someone who has never heard of it before? Oh, it's like your social media, but without ads. And without annoying features. And that's all. All right. And so just to clarify for the world, Husky is a client that you can use to access this network. And the version of it that you have developed is a version that... Actually, let's get into that in a little bit. But as far as Moonman, though, Moonman is a person who runs one of these Fediverse servers. And so what, other than that, though, how would you describe yourself, Moonman? I'm a generic software engineer. Well, actually, I'm not a software engineer anymore. I'm broad computer stuff. But yeah, I run a Fediverse server okay. and contribute some software toward that. Right. So, but going back to the original question there, the, what does the Fediverse mean to you? So uh, let's start with that. Well, first I would describe it as a mashup of email and Twitter. And uh, instead of one server, there's a bunch of servers and each one can be run as a community. What it means to me is it's an alternative place for, I think, more alternative viewpoints and opinions. It's also a lot smaller and a lot cozier, but that's kind of how I perceive it. And I definitely see it that way too, in terms of like, it's possible to have a conversation between the people in the server where it almost feels kind of like you're in a single room rather than kind of like an open street or a busy city that you'll feel like on Twitter or Facebook. And there's definitely like a psychological difference between the two. You can get the feel of the bigger world, the bigger picture on the what's called the federated feed, but at least you're given this option of like a local neighborhood. Yeah, it's really wonderful. We cultivated a community on my server, and it wouldn't be the same if it was just a clone of Twitter. So back to Albatross, though. So before we started recording here, we were talking a little bit about how there's a lot of the people who came to the Fediverse came from Twitter. And so as part of that, they kind of bring to the Fediverse, especially if they're using the Fediverse as a just sheer replacement 
for Twitter, kind of a little bit of baggage in terms of what they expect out of the Fediverse. But what in your mind is the difference between Twitter and the Fediverse? And what, what do you see as maybe features that might be relevant to that? To so be honest, I'm not uh, that frequent user of Twitter. So I, I may describe some things in a wrong way. So for me, the main difference is more the way the community, I think. The community here is really uh, uh, friendly towards each other. Not always, though. Uh, but in general, we have people with different minds, uh, with different life views, who, who just build the Fediverse more f to, to be more friendly than Twitter. I see Twitter is more opinionated. Opinion, opinionated. Uh, yeah, and just about one or maybe two, three different communities inside a big Twitter, which just talk in the same way, and that's all. While in Fediverse, there is like 10, maybe 20 groups of people who may not agree, but still just respect each other. So I think some of the reason for that is going to be the culture that was created from the very beginning, or at least very early on in the Fediverse's history, where a lot of people really did see the Fediverse in that way and see it as a, if not a community, a community of communities that all tended to have as a social more the idea that friendliness towards strangers is a good thing. And that even if you disagreed with people, you could either just completely ignore the political differences between the two of you, or in some way work it out. And as an example of this, although it's, I find it's not as common anymore, at least for a good year or two, there was almost a requirement that if you posted political things, you would tag your post or content warning your post, saying that, oh, this is politics. And just like some people don't like to see pornography, and they really do prefer it if you tag pornography or naked pictures of whatever, that people would require that if something was going to get into the kind of friction that you would see every day on Twitter, that at least you warn people so that if they don't want to get involved and they don't want to even read it, they don't have to. Now, I myself tended to not tag that part as well. But do you see, now that people aren't doing that so much, do you think that that might change with time or that we might get more politicized? There's a uh, kind of a fissure that's happening, I think, where part of the Fediverse still uses CWs and has that kind of a mindset, and the other part isn't is, is finds it to be a burden. I have mixed feelings about about content warnings, um, but I'm totally on board with flagging pornography, so I might be kind of a hypocrite in that regard. I think to some extent it's one of those things where, even for those of us who understand that we have to be careful with other people's feelings, other people's perception of how other people will perceive them in the workplace, that sort of thing, in regards to these content warnings, that there is still this problem where we have the where exactly to draw the line is not going to be a set in stone thing and the reason why i say in the workplace by the way for those again who don't use the fediverse is that like when i used to work as, as a computer programmer at saskatchewan international i would go on twitter at work and it was one of those things where if there was a minute or two between calls or a minute or two between trouble tickets or whatever it was just long enough that you could read a tweet or two i mean it doesn't take a lot of thinking to read as 144 characters and so between the moments at work where you would be doing something else, it's just long enough that you could do that. And as long as you're following, like on Twitter, you can usually get away with not seeing pictures of naked people. Unless you're going explicitly to look for it, most people don't post that sort of thing. And so on the Fediverse, if you go on the Federated feed, the kind of fire hose where you see what literally everyone in the world is posting, you will see naked pictures. They tend to be tagged as content warning, but if you're not ready for that sort of thing, it can be shocking. And so if someone walks by your desk at work or something and you have a federated feed on, uh, they may see something, right? And so it's definitely a, not by default a safe for work thing. Uh, so I can definitely see it. Now, back to Albatross though. So as far as you were talking a little bit earlier about Mastodon itself. Now Mastodon is a one of the types of servers that runs the Fediverse. But you were mentioning that there's it, maybe it has some features that you weren't uh, super fond of. What are those? So with Mastodon, I'm using the uh, Mastodon a bit. And that's how about I perceive the software as well. Or any software. It's not only about Mastodon. It's not only about Fediverse. Uh, it's every software. I think software should not 
limit the possibilities of hardware and the software should not be limited because of some people think it should be <laughs> to, to solve maybe some social problems. Uh, so Mastodon to, does the opposite. While I understand why it wants to be a clone of Twitter, it doesn't something uh, I understand. I mean, the Twitter, for example, had uh, character limits because of uh, SMS. And yes, it was the technical limitation. It was the hardware limitation. You can't just go uh, more than 140 characters. Uh, so when Mastodon copied that, it increased the limits to 500, but it's not enough. So uh, I, I, j just to I, pause I, for the listeners, though, so when he says SMS, what he means by that is the standard that early cell phones used to use to text text messages to one another. And even to this very day, when you send a text with a cell phone, most of the time you're using the SMS standard. Uh, but continue, all the trust. So where yeah. did I stop? I just read the the opposite opinion on this that small limits just encourage people to write more compact posts and while i can agree with this it indeed works so i just can't use it i don't know it's just not for me I I think. So also one other interesting thing to know, there's a book called Everybody Lies, and I don't have the authors off the top of my head. I'll link to it where this video is posted, but the book goes into a lot of big data statistics on Twitter use and other social media. And one of the interesting things they found is they actually took a big data corpus of all, as much written content uh, from letters to, to communications that they could find between people. So I guess maybe not so much books, but certainly letters. And tried to compare the writing level, the average writing level, the average communication level between people writ large in the world and in the United States. And compare it to the amount of writing skill and language skill proved to be used on Twitter. And what they found was that Twitter users tend actually to be more literate tend to be to use longer words, tend to use more complex sentences. And it's it's not even so much that they're abbreviating so that they can get more across in a single tweet, but like you'd think that the, even with 144 characters, that, oh, this is going to encourage people to simplify their thoughts and to oversimplify them. But what they found was exactly the opposite, that for whatever reason, Twitter users tended to have more complex thought to express more complex thought and to maybe even express more complex thought with time overall. So, and that was still back when it was 144, never mind the 288 or the 500 characters plus that you get with uh, Mastodon and the rest of the Fediverse servers. Now, going back to Moonman, as far as the difference between maybe the Fediverse and Twitter or Mastodon and Pleroma, what do you see as any of the features that perhaps Mastodon has or uh, tries to implement that maybe you don't agree with as much? Well, as mentioned, the, uh, the cap of 500 characters, which is set by one person who won't budge on it. They won't even make it a configuration option. You literally have to change it in the code and recompile um, so it's very hostile to, to change in addition to that like other servers like pleroma or uh, zap they can do markup in their posts where you can see rich text and again one person on the mastodon project basically doesn't want it so everyone is deprived of it so actually let's step back a little bit here so all of these servers i think so far mentioned are free software so that the code is available you can copy it you can modify it you can share it but as you've kind of mentioned, there's like one person who controls the Mastodon project specifically, which is the biggest Fediverse server and has the, the biggest user base, in, both in terms of users and people who run the software. Uh, well, it may be Gab, but... <laughs> yeah, maybe Gab, possibly, yeah. But even Gab is like a fork of Mastodon, right? So Yes. Anyway, so there's this one central point of failure that exists in the Fediverse. And so what are your thoughts on that central point of failure, that one person development model, perhaps? Well, first of all, I'm grateful to the creator of Mastodon because 
he made the Fediverse popular because Mastodon is in many ways very pleasurable to use, especially compared to GNU Social. So he gets some, uh, a lot of compliments for that. But if you compare the two biggest projects, Mastodon and Pleroma, Mastodon has a benevolent dictator for life who does take suggestions but decides himself if something's going to include it or not. On the other hand, Pleroma, one of the other pieces of Fediverse software, they pretty much say if you supply a patch, we'll take it. And there's limitations on that, but in general, they're pretty liberal about it. And that's kind of one of the reasons why I'm on Plurola. So back to Albatross. Now, you run a Fediverse server as well, the expired.mentality server. And so one, is it Mastodon or Pleroma? And two, why did you make that choice? So uh, it, it is running Pleroma. Why I did this choice? Because at first I was using Pleroma at the moment when I uh, just uh, bought the server and wanted to stop something fatty on this. And I just didn't want to, to run my own fork of Mastodon just because I want to tweak up some things. Well, after all, I still own, uh, run my own fork of Pleroma, but it has just like two files added to the source code and one of them just uh, copied from another server and others written by me which just uh, removes all of the bots from a federated uh, timeline and i found out it's really easy to write a patch to Pleroma even if it's written in a uh, language that for me as a C programmer is not so... Familiar, perhaps? It's not, yeah, it's not that familiar. <laughs> I'm not into fun functional programming yet. I agree with you there. <laughs> but Pyrom is just was easy to understand how it works. So it's just readable, I don't know. Uh, so just to maybe try to clarify, see if I got this right. The difficulty in running your own Fediverse server, and this is something that's different from your Twitter and Facebook, is that you can run your own server. And if you have either yourself or maybe you and a bunch of friends or even you and a small community or a large community, you can run your own part of the Fediverse. And in the case of Pleroma, the running the server is relatively easy as far as starting the server up, getting it up and running, getting your friends' accounts on it. All that can happen with a really a little amount of difficulty. Now, as far as the maintaining it part, the keeping it running, the troubleshooting when it goes into a, a difficulty, I've seen Moonman, you've run into trouble like that and have had to deal with it. And I mean, you are a, a software, or at least have software engineering skills and and troubleshoot along those lines. But, and of course there is this community of people in the Pleroma side of the Fediverse who do seem to be willing to help when things go wrong. But as far as your experience in troubleshooting and maintaining the server, how has that been for you? So it's leaps and bounds ahead of when I had a GNU social server. The environment has a lot of people that really know what they're doing and they're very helpful. We've had a lot of trouble for a number of reasons that don't necessarily apply to other people that are running a Pleroma server. Like, we converted from GNU social. We were originally a GNU social server. I did a giant data migration and made it into a Pleroma server. It took months to straighten that out and, because and I didn't actually know what I was doing. And I'm just going to pause here. Uh, so the, the GNU social code, that was extremely elegant and written in a sensible language <laughs> and like uh, the data database schema, that, that all made total sense, right? It was a pile of PHP and it was not intuitive at all. <laughs> we, I'm a sysadmin now and I learned more from keeping GNU social up and running than I did from my job on how to keep servers going <laughs> because of so many problems, like performance problems, code problems, everything. You name it, we had a problem. So one of the other things that has, has caused uh, challenges for us is we are one of the most connected servers. So, you know, like we talked about how there's multiple servers all over Fediverse and you talk to them. There's a uh, tool that queries set Fediverse servers and derives how many other servers they're connected to. Uh, my server is one of the most connected servers and we have the longest history and have a, a very large database and a, a reasonable number of users at this point. So that's been the challenge on our side. We're kind of at the extremes of the metrics of people running these things. Okay. So switching topics a little bit because we are having this podcast during the midst of a global pandemic. 
And given that the two of you are not here in Saskatchewan, I'm kind of curious, how has COVID been affecting your life? And what has your experience been with COVID so far? Uh, let's start with Albatross on that one. Sorry, I just dropped a cup of water. No problem. Do you need a minute uh, or something? No, no, I'm fine now. Okay. So I'm actually living in Moscow, which is now the most infected city in all Russia. You know, Russia is a really big country. So when I just uh, understood that Moscow will be the most infected, I just moved to a smaller city and uh, I'm, I'm just living there for, for a month. Thankfully, I have a relative. Right so, okay. There. So when you say you moved to the smaller city, when did you move and what made you clue in that it was going to be as bad as it's going to be, perhaps. There was rumors that Moscow will be closed on quarantine, and there will be a pass system, which I don't know is, is, is working right now, but it exists, they say. So I just thought, I'm not gonna deal with all this, and I moved. It was a month ago. Okay, so, and then another question on that side. Has Moscow ever closed due to a disease before? Is there any historical precedent for treating it that way? I don't know really one, but you know, it's not just a question, it's a rhetorical question. Can you name at least one global pandemic in our time that just made all countries close their borders? Yeah, exactly. There's really been nothing like it going back at least to the 1918 Spanish flu. And even that, I think different countries really did deal with that differently. So never mind that half the countries around weren't even around back then. It's really a different situation given we are all connected by things like the Fediverse, the internet, etc. that allow us to coordinate both individual and state reactions at a global level. So on Moonman, on your side, how has COVID been affecting you in your life and your community in your area and then i guess from there we'll start on the, the 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 bigger question that we were kind of talking a little bit about before we start. sure might as well start from. so um i've been affected pretty much significantly uh, i'm working from home have been since the beginning of uh, april self-isolating i have uh, lung issues so getting this flu could be it's, it's affected other people with my condition so it's like really critical that i don't get it i could die so i'm very very cautious our numbers have been going up in this area I mean, like, not as fast as predicted, but they're definitely rising. Our governor had a, a shutdown order and a stay-at-home order, but it did not actually have any teeth in it. It was just a suggestion. So some people are taking it seriously and some people aren't. Okay. So now, as I kind of mentioned before we started talking, we're, we're starting to talk a little bit about the social media response and the question of the dissidents, uh, the people who disagree with official policy, both at the local, state, and federal, as well as global level. So what have you seen as far as the dissidents and how they have been treated and that sort of thing? So I saw the news articles about a coordinated effort to shut down dissidents. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, they're removing people from their services in a coordinated fashion that are disputing the official guidelines or what is the knowledge of, about the virus. And and some people are obviously on the very, very fringe of that. But there's also people that just are like, okay, the numbers are not rising nearly as fast as what we were told. Or why is it that the, the deaths that are recorded are not necessarily COVID related, but they're written down as being COVID? So, so it just, just kind of pause there. I think that what you're referring to on the fringes there is there's definitely a group of people that are solidly convinced that either A, there is no COVID, or B, that it's a hoax, or C, that it's co somehow caused by uh, 5G cell phone towers being put. <laughs> And so that, if I'm interpreting correctly, is kind of the fringe side of things. But then, as, as you yes. said, uh, there was a long period of time up until this month where there was clear exponential growth. And we do seem to be entering a phase where globally, there does not even seem to be very few places at all left where exponential growth is still happening. And while there is still people getting COVID in large numbers, and I think the U.S. peaked over a million cases a couple days ago or so, there's still this decrease in the, the spread. And to some extent, it's because people are social distancing, they're not going to school, 
The whole world has been in lockdown for at least three weeks now. But at the same time, it's, as you mentioned, there's some question about what the numbers are, how well the various health departments and governments around the world have been keeping track and fatality rate. All of these things are still to a large extent up in the air. And there is room for skepticism on pretty much every data point across the board to the point where, and I'm going to link after this screen is posted, there's an interesting video on YouTube where a woman reads a series of headlines that are in and of themselves contradictory. So it's like, you should stay home except unless your home is unhealthy, in which case you should leave your home. And the mortality rate is you know, such and such, but it's also such and such. And just there's, we're awash in data and everyone I've communicated with has been talking pretty much nonstop about this topic, but it seems like there's so many different perspectives of it around. Now, back to Albatross, as far as the limiting of people in terms of what they're able to say about it and what people are able to share about it, how has that been playing out in Russia? Like has VK and other social networks really been clamping down as much or has it been primarily a, I guess, Western thing that uh, speech and discussion on this topic is being censored? I heard uh, some rumors that there is uh, censorship towards the COVID fakes. Well, just explanation uh, in Russian terms, fakes is everything that they don't like. <laughs> so it doesn't mean it's, it's truth or not. It can be everything. So I didn't see actually this, but I see a lot of efforts to keep people at home from social media, from, uh, uh, you've mentioned uh, VK, I'm using it, and it really encourages people to stay home. I don't know, is it effective or not? I don't think so. <laughs> because where I'm living right now, there is like one or two people infected. It's not so much. So people just uh, walking on the streets, without masks, without cleaning their hands every time they touch something. And I do this because, uh, because it's at least interesting for me, to be honest. Uh, it's, it's not that uh, I, I, something I experienced before, but uh, people, at least there, doesn't seem to care about uh, as much as I am. So, yeah. Also, another question for Albatross. So, out here in the West, there's been a, especially since the 2016 election, a really big tendency to blame the problems on our social media on the Russians, the Russian governments, and so on and so forth. Now, as far as from the perspective of someone living in Russia, do you see, like, is there any blame put on the Americans, the American media? Like, how much of the blame on, on COVID and what's going on uh, is kind of thrown in that direction, uh, at least from your perspective and maybe from the perspective of your media and more mainstream media out there in Russia? Well, I'm not that familiar with uh, mainstream media because the whole mainstream media is in Russia. It's uh, mostly TV and not so much internet. But uh, it, really, it, uh, it really has place, but, but mostly it's TV. I, I just don't have a TV, so... Uh, I'm not watching it. Do they put uh, a blame on the Americans? Well, it depends on who you're asking, because there is some people with a Soviet uh, mindset that Americans are, are every American is an um, evil enemy. But others people more, more young, I think, who didn't live in Soviet times, uh, like me, they don't like putting the, the all blame to everyone else. And I see that, uh, that they tend to blame uh, government instead, which really government doesn't like, of course. So, and then on to uh, Moon Man. So I'm sure you see the attempts by especially the, uh, the media in the United States to point at the Russian fake news generators, fake news bots, that sort of thing. But as far as your experience goes, like how deep of influence do you see? And what are your thoughts on the impact of Russia on the U.S. in terms of COVID? Uh, right. Well, overall, 
I, well, there, there's two things. There's what is Russia actually doing and what is the media in America blaming on Russia? Because they're almost separate sets. Yeah. <laughs> and like, I don't blame any particular country for engaging in, in sort of like ops to like manipulate other governments. Almost every government does this. I mean, I know Canada used to do it. I don't know about now, but a lot of the early stories about Russia involvement were transparently fraudulent to a person that has a reasonable amount of computer skills. You've seen articles the New York Times saying, like, uh, there's a Trump server that's connected to a Russian bank. And so they can see, like, a stream of data going back and forth. And they talk to these experts, and these experts are like, this could only be encrypted communication. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, I could fake that by just, like, pinging the server. Yeah. You know, like, but on the other hand, you have where the strong evidence that uh, Russian agents had registered Facebook pages and used them to uh, kind of like divide Americans on political issues and kind of like misdirect people on, on things. Now, if you can do the equivalent of spending $300 on Facebook ads and make, you know, some Facebook pages and throw an election, what does that say about American democracy? Like, like Russia should not be able to do that. <laughs> if they can, then there's a problem here. That's a pretty good point. You know? So, uh, oh, uh, more? Well, Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add, while this may sound kind of fantastic that Russia had bots, it actually is the truth. <laughs> they actually have a bot that are registering on YouTube on, I don't know, the game maybe, uh, but I've mostly seen them on YouTube. I've even mostly seen them on uh, Russian image boards. They are just, uh, the people here uh, just call them the Kremlin bots because <laughs> they actually bought by Kremlin to, to pro for propaganda. It actually exists. So if, if someone hears them and, and thinks that Russia did not have a bot on Facebook, in 2016, they actually had, and I think they had this power before. Why not just... Yeah, you, uh, you understand me. Yeah. yeah. Back to Moonman. Now, as far as the Fediverse goes, given that it's an alternative to the VKs, the Facebooks, the Twitters that are, if not directly coordinating with various either U.S. or Russian government, are certainly targets of it and targets of things like this network of Kremlin bots. Now, as far as the Fediverse, both now and in the possible future, do you see the Fediverse as being, I guess, a target for a, a potential target for a manipulation on that scale? And how do you see that the Fediverse is dealing with that? both now and in the future. There has been some discussion um, between different servers about what that would look like. I don't believe it's happening right now. It's actually difficult because, uh, like, say, if you have, are on Twitter, you can post inflammatory stuff and you can game people to make hashtags trend. And that kind of creates a snowball effect that, that just spreads spreads whatever information you're, you're putting out there just even further. The Fediverse doesn't have that. Like, the different servers are, are not self-contained, but, but information isn't as viral. It tends to spread out across your social graph and then stop. And, and do you see so, that even if, like right now, there's only about, what, four or five million Fediverse users. And if that right. were to grow to like 100 million or 500 million or more, would it still not be viral in that sense? It's. I really think it's connected to who you're following and the size of your social graph. What I've noticed is that things will go viral on only Mastodon.social, the, the largest Mastodon instance, but it won't necessarily go viral on all the servers that are connected to it. I mean, it might go two hops, but not much further than that. I think for that reason, so some people are really worried that it would be easier to fake, to like have fake news or to like manipulate people in the Fediverse because anybody can just spin up a new server and start creating accounts and then influence people. That's not actually convincing to me. I think that if it, it would be seen quickly and isolated by everyone else. Because we've had people join the Fediverse that kind of had had oppositional values and they were quickly uh, socially isolated. God, but... What was that, Albatross? <laughs> it sounded like there was a comment from Albatross there. No, no, no. I just mentioned that. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was actually what I was going to bring up, though. Because, like, one of our guests in a previous show had mentioned some of the fake news that had been going around and going, I guess, contained viral on the Gab server. And there's definitely, like, people susceptible to spreading false and fake 
information, if, if not even bots, trying to make things go viral on Gab. But as you've mentioned, though, it, it does seem to be contained to Gab itself. Yeah, well, part of that is the content. So, like, a lot of the stuff that ends up on Gab is kind of like boomer, like, alternative medicine, prepper survivalist stuff, or uh, QAnon. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Yeah, it's, I've, uh, I've heard kind of QAnon, but I don't think it's been mentioned on this show yet. So, what is QAnon, and what is your perspective on it? Let's start with Moonman. So, somebody on 4chan created a fake persona claiming to be high up in government and, like, fighting other government forces that were opposed to Trump. And, I mean, this is 4chan. You're not supposed to believe anything you read but a bunch of boomers believed it and it's really not sophisticated but a bunch of people believe it and, and, and i would probably add like, like it's as far as its content is concerned it's probably about as predictive as nostradamus and like yeah. they throw so much stuff out there and then try to like backwards uh define what meant what and uh, try to like claim that so many things are connected in the most uh, I guess, tenuous of ways. Now, going back a little bit, though, one of the users you had, at least for a little while, was one of the people from the New York Times. So you mentioned that the New York Times, <laughs> uh, it can be problematic sometimes. But since that happened, have you had any feedback or... Is there any, I guess, truth going backwards on that side? Or have they basically just ignored the Fediverse after that point? So uh, I'll explain who that person was. Uh, her name was Sarah Jung. She was a uh, internet journalist, and she was doing articles for Vice. And she was doing a series of articles on the Fediverse. And she had joined Mastodon and explored how it worked, and then wrote articles about it for broader audiences. In the middle of that, she was given, uh, she was like a, a New York Times position. She was like a, like a contributing editor or something. Well, before that happened, like right before that happened, she had joined my server. And I should make clear, my server server is a joke. The majority of the people on it are just having fun and, well, it's called shit posting. We just post random garbage and have fun. Well, there was a speculation that she was going to be doing a kind of a hit piece about the other side of the Fediverse besides Mastodon, be where the things were kind of more, yeah, yeah. Or at that time, we were still GNU Social. Oh, okay. But uh, kind of, we were the wild woolly side. So she got that job, though, and pretty much abandoned the uh, Vice stuff. So we never heard from her again. But before that happened, I got her to verify herself using her PGP key just to make sure it really was her. So yeah, like uh, now for promotional materials, we're like home of New York Times contributing editor Sarah Jong. <laughs> so kind of getting close to the end here. So now that the two of you are in the same place at the same time, Moonman, do you have any questions for Albatross or uh, anything that you'd be interested to know from about Albatross or his world in Moscow or his development world or anything like that? Uh, I'm interested in Husky. How's it been doing that? I noticed that it started as a fork of Tusky, but you've been adding new features to it, including features that are helpful for some of my stuff. So how is that? What do you mean, how is that? <laughs> what made you decide to do it? And do you use your own software? Oh, I'm just interested in that. Yes, I'm using my own software. I am actually started Husky just because I, you know, you subscribe to me and I like uh, to post a lot of anime pictures. And, and just because Tusky had a limitation for only four pictures, just because this enforced by Mastodon, and it is not the thing in Pleroma, you know. I just wanted, I'm just working this out. <laughs> and, and, and I'm doing my stuff. Uh, cool. I, I didn't want to contribute uh, the changes back to them, but then I thought maybe I should. And... You know, there's something, I don't know, there's something left in my mind after they decided to censor the two instances that we all know. It, it was one instance back then, so it, it, it's gap. I'm not pro-gap, I just don't like it. But I don't think it's fair to cite for other people. I, I said this before, so I thought, no, I, I will not pause them. And then when I was uh, synchronizing my changes with theirs, I noticed one commit that wasn't in, that wasn't past code review that they usually have. It was adding another instance. I guess it was Spinster. It was uh, again, I'm not pro-Spinster in any way. 
uh, sometimes I read uh, what they post and I'm just breaking my face with face downs. You're, uh, you're talking about spinster.xyz. It's like a gender critical feminist yes. instance. Yes. Like a turf. Uh, 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 feminist. Feminist. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, turf. <laughs> yeah, I don't like them. But again, the how they make it, they just bypass the code review. They bypass everything at this point and silently added one another instance to block list. So the step I just didn't like that and I thought no I will never contribute them back features. Maybe not fixes but not features at all. Okay that's a that's a cool sense on that side but just to step back for those uh, who are not in the know on this. So over the past while on the Fediverse there's been a tendency first with servers and then afterwards with clients, so the thing that you would install maybe in an app store to connect to the Fediverse, to basically block certain servers from being accessible. So originally it would have been something like Mastodon.social, the main flagship server, would not have talked to or federated with servers like, for example, shitposter.club or gab.com, two other I mean, moon mans and bigger, maybe un more unpopular one. And then later on with clients like Husky that uh, Albatross's fork is based off of, started adding it to the client level. So even if your server would allow you to communicate with these other servers that are politically unpopular, that the client itself would block you on some level from communicating with them. And so Albatross's version does not have this block list on it, so that you can still communicate with Gab, and I guess this turf spinster instance, which we'll get into maybe what a turf is in a later show. But now, as far as Albatross, now again, we are kind of getting to the end of the show, so is there anything you'd like to get across to the world now that you have the world's attention? Anything you'd like to say to the world? Oh, okay. Mm. You know, just if I understood correctly, this show is about uh, things that make a box a box. Yes? The things that which? The things that make me mad. Oh, that, that's certainly one of them, yeah. So one of the things is that people, at least for now, in, in the internet, are overreacting to things. What do I mean overreacting? It's just, you know, about uh, the cancel culture. I don't mm. like it at all. And that's what I call overreacting. They just uh, take small problem and make <clears throat> and wall elephants from this. Maybe that's why it's called Mastodon. <laughs> so what do I want to say to the world? Just don't be like that. If you have any problems, just sit down with yourself and try to think. Maybe they're not worth the the amount of attention that you have that, that you want to get so yeah good thoughts to end on on that side and especially i would add not even at, at the individual level but as well at the larger social level both in communities and, and larger that we do spend attention and our focus on maybe people or institutions that do wrong but there is a uh, definitely a level at which point it gets where everyone's freaking out over something very small. And it's, it's definitely possible to overreact on that side. Uh, so good thoughts to end on, on that side. Boom Man, now that you have the attention of the whole world, is there anything you'd like to get through? Oh, yes. Join the Fediverse. It's fun. You can join my server. It is shit poster.club. Uh, we got a very small set of rules, and I think that we actually have a very positive community. Um, or join uh, one of the other servers. It's free. That's it. All right. Well, thank you, Albatross and Moonman, for joining the show today. And uh, for the rest of you, just as a reminder, this is a listener-supported show, so you can support this show and uh, encourage it to continue to exist by going to subscriberstar.com slash Jeff dash Cliff. And with that, I will see you all next week, and I'm going to fade out. Well, I guess I don't have the goodbye song today, so I'm just going to end here, and I'll see you all next week.